name is Professor Henrietta Moore, and I'm the founder and director of the IGP. It's a pleasure to see you all here this evening. Before I introduce our distinguished speaker, can I just remind you that we are being live streamed, but that will stop before the Q&A, so you will not feature, so never fear, you will not be on the live stream. We have news let us sign up for, please do sign up, we'd like to know all of you better, and please come again. And please tweet us, so at Globro, in the hyphen in the middle. So today we are extremely lucky to have my old friend and very distinguished colleague, Rosie Brajotti. Professor Rosie Brajotti, as many of you know, is a uh, distinguished uh, philosopher and feminist theoretician. She's a visiting professor here at the Institute for Global Prosperity, and she is, of course, the founding director of the Center for Humanities at Utrecht University. Rose's publications uh, in continental philosophy, at the intersection of social and political theory, cultural politics, gender, feminist theory, ethnicity, um, post-humanism, and uh, many others. And those began, I think, perhaps with patterns of dissonance, through metamorphoses, nomadic subjects, nomadic theory, <clears throat> and most recently, the co-edited volumes on conflicting humanities and the post-human glossary. So Professor Brydon is going to talk this evening about what is the human in the humanities today, <clears throat> and explore understandings of the human in contemporary academic and public discussions. And I'd like you to join me in welcoming her to the Institute for Global Prosperity. Thank you, Professor Moore. Thank you, dear Mirta. And thank you all. And I understand there's some digital people out there. So welcome as well. Great honor to be here. Uh, I expected a small work in seminar, so haha. Uh, <laughs> um, we will do our best. Um, and also wonderful to um, be able to put to good use my great privilege of being a recurring visitor at the Institute for Global Prosperity, which will be for the next couple of years. So look forward to continuing conversations. I structured the presentation as a series, almost of bullet points, thinking that we will all work on this uh, together. So I may go a little bit quickly, and then we can come back over some of the points in the question and answer. Time. I hesitate whether it should be sort of uh, crouched on this like a chick, a chickadee, or lying down <laughs> on that magnificent piece of medical architecture. <laughs> if you see me disappearing and reclining, <laughs> you will understand why. So um, I have been uh, looking uh, seriously at shifting understanding and practices of the human within the field that used to be the humanities, but since about 20. 10 has been uh, uh, called, uh, named again as the post-humanities. Karen Wolf um, is the, has the paternity of that particular term. Uh, the book series that Minnesota University Press has been pumping out post-humanities knowledge for five or seven, eight years. Uh, and uh, you may think, ah, oh, another post. We need that like we need a nail in the head, and it's absolutely true. Uh, but it is part of a new configuration of knowledge. As a student of Foucault, I chase um, knowledge production. Um, I chase the intersections of discourses and power as they evolve in the world around us. Uh, what I learned the most in my years in France, way back, and it was still the Cold War, believe it or not, <laughs> uh, was the importance of keep asking the question, what kind of knowledge is being produced all around us? What kind of subjects of knowledge are we being encouraged to become? Uh, and how does this intersect with powerful interests and power being not only a dirty word, as we know, Foucault, but also an empowering term, which is both negative and positive, both potestas and potentia. It's empowering and uh, in, in, in imprisoning at the same time. And I think it, that, that oscillation to the positive and the negative will show very clearly when we enter the non human, post human universe. Assumption, big one, risky one, be careful if you're a PhD student, 
the present, and that it is possible to access the present. And it is possible and actually desirable to study the present in the field of the humanities, which is conceptually and institutionally married to the past. And there is hardly any discipline of the humanities that is not the history of its own field. Literature is the history, literature, philosophy, history, philosophy, art is the history of art. Um, there is an assumption about the authority of the past that is built into the practice of the humanities. And Gilles Deleuze, one of my teachers, wrote a very important book called The Anti-Oedipus, where, in 1972, believe it or not, where, among other things, he zones in on the necessity of questioning the authority of the past while respecting. Everything has to be respectful, but with a critical edge. And why not dare the challenge of the present? And the, the here and now, taking all the risks um, of making analyses, I call them cartographies of knowledge, they may not prove completely exhaustively right, but they are cartographies, mappings. They are routes across what is happening now. The now here, the definition of the present, is drawn from the Leslie Guattari's take on Bergson, the philosopher of time, and time continuum, the present is both the record of what we are ceasing to be and the seeds of what we're in the process of becoming. It is both and. and looking to the past, projected to the future in a continuum. It is both actual and virtual. Um, and consequently, mapping the present is not um, only a taking stock of what is or is ceasing to be, it is also backing trends emergent tendency of what we're in the process of becoming. So the assumption is clear, we're in the process of becoming big time posthuman through what I call the convergence. The convergence phenomenon between posthumanism as the critique of universalist man and anthropocentrism as the critique of anthropos. They convergence between two strands that do interlock. And it is, of course, if you critique man, you would think that you would automatically critique um, species supremacy. But if you look at the scholarship, this is not the case at all. There have been absolutely honorable, memorable critiques of humanism, think of Edward Said as one, um, uh, that are actually uh, reasserting um, the uh, uh, anthropocentric uh, biases about the centrality of a Eurocentric notion of the human, of man. It is possible to critique humanism in the name of humanism. That's the strength of humanism and the key to its longevity. And it is quite possible to, criti to critique humanism in its racist, sexist, anthropocentric, eurocentric uh, assumptions and leave out the question of anthropos. I would go further. In the humanities, we don't even have a language to speak of ourselves in terms of species. Um, Darwin is not part of our canon. Dante is, but not that one. <laughs> and and uh, we, we, are, we are not trained to think in terms of species. And, and this is producing a number of aporias and a number of problems in this time and age, as I will try to argue. Um, convergence, two things coming together or crossing over, not a harmonious synthesis, quite a contested intersection, producing all kinds of leaps hopefully qualitative, but also in the short term, quantitative. Uh, the challenge of this convergence is to keep both the specificity of each line of critique and their convergence, and that they're overlapping. And, uh, and it is important not to just critique anthropocentrism, leaving the humanism in place, and not to just critique humanism without raising the question of anthropocentrism. Um, the risk of not doing this as a convergence is that we would produce, again, segregated knowledges. I will give you an example. Your standard uh, anti-fascist, anti-racist, post-colonial, decolonial um, uh, assemblage, uh, whether it's a conference or an event, um, the, the constituencies would be diverse. We would have all kinds of humanoids participating. This syllabus would in two-thirds two of the time, the syllabus would contain little or no media and technologies. You go to a media and technology event, conference, syllabus, it would be the other way around. Zero diversity, mostly young boys, uh, no concern for 
race, class, and ethnicity, or uh, gender issues, resegregation of, um, of knowledge. And I think it's to avoid keeping these lines of critiques apart that I want to stress the convergence and encourage that we do not do one line of critique without the other, that we try ways in which this um, critique can be of a complex phenomenon, complexities. And can we have the contemporary humanities be a branch of complexity theory? Can we stop being considered the soft sciences and be actually claim for ourselves the role of subtle, complex sciences? And, and looking at multiple convergences as multifaceted events. The reason why we need to do this has to do with the conditions of our historicity. A condition that sees a massive industrial revolution called the Fourth Industrial Age, led by our science and technology, uh, by, uh, by neural robotic science, by information technologies, biogenetics, nanotechnology, an incredible moment um, in our science and technology progress. UCL out there, one of the leaders in so many of these fields. You, you should feel so proud to be even part of this. I certainly do. Um, and, and of course, and a moment, a leap forward in human knowledge. But this enormous um, uh, revolution is not evenly spread at all. <laughs> and the access to the benefits of this massive um, uh, technological, neural robotic AI revolutions are very unevenly spread. And, and here, one of the ways in which you can test this is by doing the work that my good friend Yusuf Parika Siddiqui, the audience, hello, does so very well, is to trace the geology of the new media, trace the digital waste, test, trace what happens to those beautiful sleek machines when they expire, as they do, not only because they have planned obsolescence built in, but because machines do, and they're shipped away being dismembered and dislocated in con working conditions, child labor, unpaid labor, really reminiscent of modern day slavery, it is called modern day slavery in, in humanitarian organizations. And may I point out how difficult it is to get online at least a photograph of digital rubbish with a label on it that would say Apple digital rubbish and a Samsung digital rubbish. Almost impossible. You can get photoshops of branded organic waste. You can get Coca-Cola bottles. You can get Vegemite uh, jams. And you can get Mars bars wrappers. Try to find online something that would have this sort of thing with Apple on it. Uh, there is in, 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 the, in the imaging that goes with the fourth industrial revolution and um, the gritty, uh, embedded, embodied relations of power are absolutely added out of the picture. So this is what our agriculture looks like these days, certainly in Holland, and sleek, beautiful, post-natural greenhouses. Um, that give you the impression that um, our food is hygienically uh, sort of self-replicating. And, uh, and of course, um, the other face of the same story is the sixth extinction, the extent to which our planet is absolutely in trouble in terms of its sustainability, more importantly, our oceans, great source of oxygen, are um, uh, actually uh, in a, in a at a, at a level of um, salination, of, of, of uh, um, suffocation that is almost unresolved. The plastic problem is not uh, just a single specific issue. According to the OECD, we have 12 years before the irreversibility, when the production of carbon dioxide will be irreversible. Um, and without oxygen, well, uh, we can always retreat into the greenhouses, as opposed to some sort of uh, artificial environment. So fourth industrial revolution, with all the differential access to the enormous and advances that it promotes, and uh, unbelievable transformation of the means of production of our sustainability, food, and sixth extinction. And, and, it is not as if we have the sixth extinction on Monday and the fourth industrial revolution on Tuesday and the problem of the salivation of the seas on Wednesday. They are happening at the same time. Hence this issue of the convergence, how important it is to keep the complexities. And one of the critics, the criticism 
I will have of what's happening in the humanities is the emergence of new areas of discursively segregated discourses. And uh, the Anthropocene being one, we will go to one in a minute. And that focus on one aspect of this conquered situation simply because our minds crack under the stress of thinking and and, and they're not just two simple opposites, they're polar opposites, the fourth industrial age and the sixth extinction. My God, who chose to be born in this era? Get me out of here. No wonder extropianism and futurism uh, is particularly in the, in the counterculture are so very strong. So get me out of here is a theme that is coming across. Um, and have a look at our posthuman glossary. We have flyers out here. We just put out a posthuman glossary, 107 entries, 92 authors, to, to very short pieces to try to summarize the situation. Look at the entry on Afrofuturism, uh, the entry on uh, extropianism, the entries on extreme punk and transhumanism. And there's a lot of people really dreaming of extraterrestrial and sort of big me up Scotty type of thing. Okay, so the Anthropocene is one of the areas where this discussion is happening, and the Anthropocene is a complicated field of studies. First of all, it has lost um, its scientific titre de noblesse. It's not accepted as a scientific concept. We thought that our era would be scientifically known as the Anthropocene. That is not the case. And there is not enough scientific evidence of the traces of human activity into the sedimented structures of our planet to justify a change of geological era. This is quite a blow, because until August last year, we thought that we could actually parade the Anthropocene. So don't use it for your applications, because it has no scientific credibility. Moreover, the Anthropocene is a, a one of those concepts, and there will be more coming up in my presentation if time allows it, that has entered a specific speed of self-replication. Uh, one of the traits of contemporary knowledge is the speed with which concepts go berserk. Um, uh, you take a notion, the human would be a really good one, the posthuman, the inhuman, but the reasonable, boring, ugly terms, posthuman couldn't really get much worse, but they enter a spin and they start self-replicating um, uh, in a manner that is velocity, speed, or together with Ashir Membe and Sarah Nato, we call it epistemic accelerationism. Look what happens to what was an otherwise sedate, normal concept, the Anthropocene. It has gone completely schizoid. The Anthropocene, look at the dates of the publication, yesterday morning. All of these are <laughs> pro proper publications, serious, and uh, I said that there's, there's more. Uh, but they are really not respectable. This is all uh, respectable. There is, you, you see out there, for the obscene, et cetera, et cetera. If you find more, please send them, because I am collecting them. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, the differential speed with which concepts enter this schizoid body <coughs> is typical of advanced, also known, cognitive capitalism. Any concept enters the spinning machines and basically gets dematerialized and uh, gets deterritorialized. Isn't the language terrible? And the language of the laws, but it does get the idea that there are speeds by which what was uh, solid melts into uh, thin air and goes absolutely out of uh, control. No one, where there is a lot of nervousness about it and, and the anxiety about what is happening to the human is a solid body of scholarship. And I've selected it again uh, from an Abbas array. Um, there, there are serious panic manifestos um, up there. Scranton learning to die in the Anthropocene. I mean, it tells it all. But I've selected some that are less hysterical than others, shall we say. Fukuyama, can you believe this guy? First he declares the end of time, yeah. and then in the posthuman future he calls for an actual regulation of our science and technology. You could have thought about it before. Uh, <laughs> uh, regulate this thing before they steal the human, and the cover of our posthuman future tells the story, beautiful raw of white face babies. White, the whiteness factor is crucial in this literature. And one of my working definitions of the Anthropocene is white panic. And the sky is falling. And uh, we are in trouble. And, and the we here will become the source of my contestation. Who is the we? Who is the human? 
that is being now tracked and, and contested in this strange exercise. Habermas, a different exercise, 2003, just converted to Catholicism. Uh, I refer to his conversation with the then um, Cardinal Ratzinger, soon, soon to be uh, Pope Benedict XVI, uh, about the nature of Christian natural law in relation to respect for the environment and the limitations of technology. Um, it is also the conversation in which Ratzinger pronounced uh, his famous anti Nietzsche dictum. Ratzinger, Benedict XVI, has nightmares about Nietzsche. It's, Nietzsche is his own personal enemy. And the famous line was that Christianity is the only religion that has an intrinsic connection to reason, uh, which leaves all the other religions with it. You can fill in the rest of this. Right? For natural law, uh, Christian theology, very strong in the Anthropocene. Bruno Latour, a very respectable scholar, a trained theologian, you can see the traces of this kind of thinking, Christian pathological thinking, emerging uh, in the background of the anthropogenic discourse. Sloterdijk in dialogue with Heidegger, I don't know what to do with Gustav Sloterdijk, and not again, but there are very interesting dialogue on the letter of humanism rewritten in posthuman eras. And His Holiness the Pope, not, I'm not a, well, I'm a cultural Catholic, but uh, extremely interesting um, guy, uh, very concerned. And the Pope's definition of the Anthropocene is capital scene, that means it's capitalism that has killed the planet. And he, when he had a famous seminar at Castel Gandolfo a few years ago on the on climate change, he invited, you know we invited, who his personal guest was. You can just imagine all these cardinals, the Pope, and the Pope's own special guest, Naomi Klein. Um, <laughs> So look out for him, and one of my standard exercises is to take a couple of, of, of pages from the Encyclical Letter on, uh, on the on the Anthropocene, take off the name of the author, present it to my students, and say, who has written this? And two-thirds of the class regularly say, Watari, uh, because it is, of course, the continuum and all that, and then, of course, there's a couple of concepts that give it away. No, it isn't. But it's, it's borderline. A scholarship of anxiety, a great deal of it. I would say this humanities and social sciences do practically in the institutions nothing else than pump up the anxiety and analyze anxieties, vulnerabilities, form of mortality, much more emphasis on the sixth on the sixth extinction than on the fourth industrial revolution in the humanities and social sciences. So there is already a sort of division of labor, engineering and life sciences fourth industrial age, looking at the science of the technology. Human science, the humanities and social sciences, the extinction bit. And, uh, we take the corpses, they take the new uh, bodies to be. This is subtle but persistent, and maybe it's something that we need to reflect upon. An ideology of vulnerability and mournfulness and across the field of the humanities, because we can't cope with what is coming. At us. I will go very quickly over the next slot because these are the bullet points. The context within which this is happening, um, a context where the, the, the imaginary of disaster, the sense of melancholia and loss is persistent, is of course advanced capitalism, which used to be a system that produced things, quantitative proliferations of objects, multiples of one, lots and lots of multiples of one, quantitative outpour of products. And, well, those were the days where capitalism gave you a sense of identity, and, uh, sold your identity through consumer fetishism. And, and for the millennials out there, your fetishism is, of course, the technology. And you, you don't need Prada shoes, you don't need cars and baby boomer stuff. You need your apples and, and the iPhones. And you need to change them every 18 months, because otherwise. So your relationship to Commodity fetishism is through the technology, so don't dismiss it immediately, give it a chance by looking at the technology as your fetishist object. Look up fetishism in Freud and in Marx, very useful uh, 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 topics to be uh, looking at. So that used to be the case, the case when um, men, Anthropos, was simply commodified. Well, that has shifted dramatically. We now have cognitive, also known as research-driven capitalism, I mean, where what is constitutes proper capital is the knowledge about living systems. Whether the living systems are biogenetic, nanotechnological, or algorithmic, there are entire classes of scholars that actually design living systems. And, uh, I, I, I have 
several friends. I'm sure you see it comes off. I'm designing several other videos today. A couple of them didn't exist as well. They survived or not is their problem, but I brought them into me. A huge shift. Um, this is the images, of course, that become unrepresentable. If the side of this by now a banality, artificial meat is almost unrepresentable. It looks like meat. It has all the proteins in meat. It was made, among other things, at Maastricht University. I think UCL was involved somehow. The first prototype was $325,000. Now it's 17 bucks. Artificial hamburgers, ready to go. All the proteins are in place. Unfortunately, our brains cannot take Our neural system cannot taste it yet. But we will come to that human enhancement being, of course, the next step of this story. A different type of market economy, where it is life itself that is capital, owning the genetic codes of lifelines and reproducing them, farming them out, and um, is what constitutes capital. This is why the universities are at the center of this gigantic fourth industrial revolution. And this is why within the universities, there are incredible distinctions between the disciplines, the areas of research, that produce marketable life forms, usually the life sciences, and the humanities and social sciences, which specialize in corpses, really. Uh, we are just dealing with uh, the risk analysis, and we are certainly not able to produce anything marketable. It is a huge injustice. And if you follow some of my work, you know that I've said this time and time again, that the strength and the weakness of humanities and social sciences is that we use ordinary language to do extraordinary things, to be precise, accurate, incisive, compassionate, but critical, creative, but analytic, amazing balancing acts. And, and if you look at some of the terminology that's coming out of the posthuman fields, each neologism should be patented as if it were a scientific discovery. And we should change royalties for every time anybody uses one of our neologisms. But you can see the problem. And, this is ordinary language, we cannot tax it. And if the same formulation was put down as a biochemical formula, an algorithm, or a mathematical formula, we could charge, charge money for it. But ordinary language is simultaneously free, economically shared, and unprofitable. And there, in one nutshell, is the problem of the contemporary humanities, doing extraordinary things within ordinary language and not being paid for it, and uh, <laughs> not being able to patent the products of our intelligence. It is a huge issue for those of you who are in teaching and research, and I think we should start thinking about actually charging royalties for concepts and ideas. Quickly then, cognitive capitalism, also known as research capitalism, research-driven information capitalism, the varying platform capitalism, there are different, different um, ways of approaching it. Uh, resting on this advanced technology, informational power of um, a living matter itself, scientific and economic understanding of all that lives. And biopiracy, but we shall return to that Bandana Shiva way back in 1997, looking at again at how this type of cognitive capitalism is very unevenly spread. And, uh, that means one third of households in the world don't even have electricity let alone um, the advanced laboratories in UCL and Utrecht can boast of. So it's very uneven, and, and the profits that emerge from it are very, very uneven. In fact, if you read Piketty and some of the serious uh, economic critics, we are living in an era of absolute monopoly capitalism and extreme concentration of wealth, with Apple and Amazon through the threshold of trillions of dollars and of profits, something that we have not seen since the first industrial revolution. So the, the complexities and the paradoxes of this. And uh, we also know that Goldman Sachs had to open a special branch uh, of investment uh, venture capital for millionaires and billionaires under the age of 30. Uh, because of the new economy. And because you can, that is part of the picture, a complex um, picture, not easily classifiable within the classical Marxist class struggle. And, uh, what constitutes class today is access to this, this uh, uh, fourth industrial revolution. And that access is controlled by a multiplicity of factors, and of which geopolitical location, uh, and consequently class, race, ethnicity, gender, and, 
uh, age play enormous roles. So a mixture of the old world and is the end and phenomenon. I have to mention the necropolitical, the extent to which the products of an enormous scientific revolution fuel a war machine that is of gigantic proportions and incredibly smart. I think the, the British government just recently, uh, looking at Emily up there, uh, just recently uh, legalized the production of weaponry that can decide when to kill. Is that correct? And, uh, until now, drones have some regulatory mechanisms and the moral algorithm, as we used to call it. I think it was two weeks ago, or like 10 days ago, the UK government lifted that. We lifted, we have drones and killing machines that decide when to shoot. And, and there is no intervention there, certainly not by bioethics committees, but by human um, consciousness at all. It's extraordinary that it would take the cows of Brexit to sneak in a piece of legislation of this magnitude. Um, uh, quite extraordinary, so don't let that Brexit confuse you. World migration is a systemic, it's a systemic element um, of our uh, times. Uh, Saskia Sassen's book, Expulsion, says amazing statistics on this. It's, it's a structural element that over 60 million people roaming the earth and growing. And it is not a crisis, it is not an element that we can solve, it's a systemic feature of the relocation of resources and labor, something that we need to deal with. And the idea of temporary camps and a temporary uh, assembly, the temporary uh, sort of townships um, and needs to be looked at again. This temporariness is here to stay and we need to look at it very, very critically. There are several detention camps in every major city. Get to know your own. Um, know where they are, uh, insert them into the urban structures. I mean, this is how, they're part of what we are. They're not extreme crises that we need to solve. This is not going to be solved, um, uh, no matter what the populists tell us, and they're telling us some rubbish um, in this respect. So anxiety, uh, necropolitical elements, great discovery, but also perpetuations of forms of uh, exclusion and disqualification, really an age of transition, you could say, and, and the size of, uh, of Tibet, gigantic. And, and this, this transition has different elements in it, and within this field, I have been focusing on the creative aspect of the posthuman conditions. I've been, I've been focusing on the new scholarship that is emerging, running alongside the critical scholarship um, uh, that is looking at um, the left behinds um, and the excluded. And I will come back to the left behinds in my conclusion. This field is the question of the posthuman as a research field. Um, and humanism, inhumanism, posthumanism, actually are quite established. The posthuman manifesto of Pepperell is 50 years ago. Um, and in, in, in this first inception, they are futuristic manifestos for where our science and technologies are going to go. Optimistic, upbeat, some of them dystopic, but if you go back 15, 20 years, the division of labor is science fiction does the dystopia, and social theory does the futurism. And a cynical Valley makes sure that Kurzweiler and those people with the singularity and the uploading of human consciousness into the computer, that sort of cynical Valley delusion, as it is called, is actually spread across um, universities included as a kind of a mission statement that we need to create a posthuman universe whereby human consciousness, whatever that may be, can be uploaded into the um, internet and into the um, clouds of the future. China is running with it, Korea is running with it, it's the great big idea of uploading my consciousness into the computer. The center for it is Oxford, I'll come to the Oxford Institute in a minute. Um, it, the early literature is a little bit more cautious, but there is that sense of futuristic um, um, kind of uh, uh, vigor in it. The Gaia two people, like Bruno Clark, um, are a little bit more cautious. Um, Clark, with post-anthropocentric metamorphosis, is coming into the discussion from Gaia. How is the planet doing under the strain of the sixth and uh, the sixth and fourth industrial revolution? Much more cautious, um, looking at the post-anthropocentric as something that can mean to a very large extent um, uh, post-life um, 
the Anthropos is not going down elegantly. Anthropos is bringing down the earth with it. And we lost 3,000 species of insects just in the last five years. The north of Europe has no insects. And uh, in the two years ago in the Netherlands, we had no blackbirds because there were no insects. And, and I missed the blackbirds like hell. And then this year we have a couple, bees, of course, um, uh, not surviving. This, this is a change. So this is what I mean, the irreversibility point um, is being reached, whereby we will not be able to recreate um, the, the missing species. It's a chain reaction. Remember Einstein's, if the bees go, we go. Um, it's a chain. Um, and people like Clark are very aware of it. Um, uh, and all the, the, all the Gaia environmentalist people are on to this. But these are the people that I remember as a young feminist studying with Foucault. We used to call the, the, the ecological people soft in the head. Um, I remember that so clearly, soft in the head, because they were talking about the planet, the earth, um, these this kind of funky, hippie things. Um, but we had to worry about the socialist revolution and the overturning of patriarchy. I'm doing the, the self-criticism here. More serious matters. And the, the division between green politics and red politics um, has been a factor in so much post-war European political culture. That's one of the other things that needs to be remixed and rechanged in this convergence. We need purple politics that mixes them. And, and of course, purple parties are flourishing across Europe, look at Germany. Yes, alternative for Deutschland is picking up points, but so are the Greens, and, and the purple Greens, and the, the red Greens. And so it's a very interesting way by which you could t tell a genealogy of progressive politics as well. Um, but the disregard of Marxist politics for the environment is one of the features that we need to focus on and try to correct, because it is absolutely uh, devastating. Since uh, it will be is that the literature on extinction um, is a whole uh, kind of uh, story. You can probably get some grants if you put extinction in your title. Um, uh, it's a top priority, I would say. It's not always thinking of your future, of course. Um, uh, again, um, a different brands of this, just to give you an example of how very alive, uh, how very not critical the field is. But I will return with a more thorough list, and this is a more thorough list, the different types of posthumanism that I can recommend. There are more, and you will find them all in the posthuman glossary. I, I can go quickly as a bullet point because you can look them up. Um, all of them with their own specific angle, uh, insurgent posthumanism is really not the cultural uh, posthumanism, but all claiming the necessity of a qualitative leap in our thinking about what constitutes the basic <laughs> unit of reference to define the human. And, uh, what is it? Is it the anthropomorphic envelope? Is it our supposedly transcendental consciousness? What is it exactly? And with a growing number of, of, of people, but I haven't found a solid enough scientific treaty to put it on my slides for UCL yet, who are actually identifying sexuality as pleasure as the I actually defining features um, of something that could be the human. And, but that's in, in, in the now day and age, we are in sort of uh, dangerous territory there. So go easy on it, but certainly think of Franz de Waal the primatologist who's criticizing the role of chimpanzees in our understanding of evolution by opposing to them the bonobos, who are the female-led upper primates who settle their conflicts by having absolute overdoses of orgastic sex. Um, uh, extraordinary. And, 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 First of all, is teaching at Emory and at Utrecht. It, is, it was in the Time Magazine list of 100 most important scholars. Uh, look at this critique of chimpanzee-centered primatology, where it's rape and murder that dominates the understanding of evolution. It's how about pleasure and sharing sex as the motors of evolution? And that he, he gives absolutely credible scientific evidence to shift um, the, the basic unit of what could allow us to define as the human. Go easy on it, unless you are a primatologist, but I think it's a field where those of you who have training in psychoanalysis or a relationship to it can bring it to bear on this discussion um, uh, today. 
Okay, what's true my my political family always out there when it's a question of linking women, non-humans, including monstrous and alien others, and the feminists are first in line, get me out of here, uh, anything rather than white patriarchy. And, and you will find equivalent strong uh, literature in was colonial race theory in Afrofuturism. Mars has to be better than white slavery ridden patriarchy and uh, Eurocentric. Anything has to be better than this planet. And I think it's a very interesting look. Octavia Butler would be an, an author for you to look at um, in, in terms of science fiction where race and the struggle against um, Eurocentric patriarchy are first and foremost, um, again, the role of literature in this. But these are only annotations and um, bullet points. Here it is. Uh, I, def I will defend all of my statements and, uh, by quoting the glossary, because I need to move on. And this I really want you to think about, the institutional answers. Because there's always a moment in my presentation where people say, oh, yeah, well, this is science fiction, you're making it up. But I wish I had such imagination. Uh, but um, this is an uh, empirically verifiable uh, institutional reality. And first, first and foremost, the Oxford Institute. Um, uh, Nick Bostrom, Future of Humanity Institute. Google it as I speak, um, and you will see. Transhumanists, um, classical transhumanism, translating the Cambridge Silicon Valley into academic knowledge. And the research project, multi-million pounds of research project, ERC grants included, is called, and I think you are sitting down, superintelligence. Because, you know, this is Oxford, we're not messing around, first you know, the populace in the world, thereabouts. And, and the actual project is um, human enhancement. Human enhancement because our neural system, our brains, are slower than the computational network that we have created. Eight seconds, but it's enough to make us too slow to keep up with what we have engendered. This is why the British government has allowed drones to shoot at their own speed that are faster than we. Our brains are old, ladies and gentlemen. So the Bostrom says, let's accelerate them. Through implants, to interfaces with computers. And, uh, and, the, and the assemblage would be then neurosciences, clinical psychology, philosophy of language. It's, I'm not, it's not science fiction, it's Oxford. Hundreds of PhD positions getting there, a strong posthumanist project, brilliant stuff, and superb, and total science fiction. And, and what the Oxford Institute does, it gives you the formula you need for your own grants, if you, for your own career. Because while being a transhumanist committed to an evolutionary mutation of our species, Nick Bostrom, when it comes to values, reverts to the Enlightenment. He is an Enlightenment man. He believes in rationality, objectivity, universal goodness, all the values for which the West is the best, and presents human enhancement as the fulfillment of the Enlightenment project of the betterment of humanity through science. It's the logical step. So here you have the formula, which I believe is the core of cognitive capitalism, analytically post-anthropocentric, normatively neo-humanist. And that formula is in a nutshell, and the Silicon Valley translated into the academics. We reattach this immense convergence to a notion of the single liberal individual, the 18th century definition of the self, and we enhance that self to superhuman, superintelligence proportions. A nightmare in my terms. And, and my posthuman work is a critique of this um, uh, kind of syllogism of this new paradigm, encouraging the next generation of researchers to look at it very carefully. There are several projects in the Anthropocene campus I'm involved with in Berlin and in Melbourne where people are actually doing cartographies of the different forms of enhancement that are currently being funded not only written about, because people have been writing about robots and Superman forever, that are currently being funded by research institutions, neurologically, biogenetically, pharmaceutically, in terms of, of um, prosthesis, and all of that. Quite extraordinary how advanced the project of human enhancement actually is. And it is at a time like that that I want to go back to my images, I should have reshoot to be able to think, I want to go back to this moment. Oh, 
time ago. Well, we have this, and this, and this. And five minutes, I'll never make it. Um, well, we need to remember the context within which this, the Silicon Valley transhumanist paradigm analytically passed on for centrically, normatively new humanist, is taking place in this context. This, this, in this context of extreme polarization of access. And, and the question to Boston would be, well, you know, who decides who's going to be enhanced just for one? But to go back to the institutional answer, Cambridge is there. I'm the team of the Cambridge, they always do this. It's like the Henry Regatta all over again. The Center for the Study of Existential Risk, funded by Skype, Martin Rees and Hugh Price, superb brains, incredible intellects. And, and looking at the uh, risks involved, essentially, in what Oxford is doing. It's creating each other's jobs. They would trick, remember this. <laughs> But, but it's important work because they are looking at the risks for the planet, for society, for the individuals of pushing this fourth industrial age into the very structure, the very fibers of the human. Again, in, interesting place. Really to, to look at them carefully as potential career paths for yourself and what amazing brains. I respect all of them and I disagree with them respectfully. Um, but I also admire them greatly. Sweden, very different answers. Linchoping, the post humanities hub, also national research um, funding, um, but completely in the critical mode. Um, looking at the critical path, which I will quickly stretch uh, and try to sketch for you in the, in, by going over my five remaining minutes and um, bringing the critical theory of the last uh, 30 years to bear on the question of the post human. Um, very well funded, um, flipping over into post, post humanities in the, in the form of environmental humanities, digital humanities, and uh, again, a wonderful place to work. Germany, enormous funding. Uh, the Anthropocene project, uh, which is now finished, the last of four years, been replaced by the Technosphere project. Van Humboldt, Deutsche Museum, and House of Culture of the Welt, AKW, 50 million the first time, 60 million the second time, hundreds of PhD. A project to study the impact of the Anthropocene on culture and the humanities and federal money taken at the source. <coughs> I don't know any other academic or scientific culture that has invested that much except Oxford, but Oxford put it in a specific container, uh, the transhumanists. The Germans are keeping a very broad open, great presence of artists designers, um, uh, exhibitions, um, uh, movies, documentaries, very diversified. Um, uh, and uh, they are also putting together a dictionary, which is called the Dictionary of Now. Uh, very much resonating with what we're trying to do in our um, angle with engaging with the present and look at the extent to which you need to use glossaries, dictionaries, indexes, non-linear academic products to account for a very complex convergence. We are not in a position to write a linear monograph on this. It's really too complex. Canada, in the Canadian research money at Brock University, an entire fully fledged posthumanism research institute. And going in for a second <coughs> multi-million dollar research grant at the moment. Look it up, Christine Dagler, phenomenal, strong diversity in line through it, but not only. And the Danish, Denmark, years of work at our house. Um, again, artists, activists, um, scholars on posthuman aesthetics and the new human. And that same permanent visitor there, um, uh, the future lecture series to which I had the honor to contribute. Again, national research money to the tune of millions to try to zoom in on this convergence and what the implications of it are for us. Journals. Korea to the forefront here, unstoppable. Um, Journal of Posthuman Studies now up to the fourth issue. Transhumanity is already quite established. And out of Switzerland, the website, Critical Posthumanities Network, coming out of Bern, um, with a strong complete angle. So it, this is the beginning of the making of a proper academic field. And very advanced, much more advanced, and the speed with which it advances, and quite staggering. How I would narrate the story in terms of bringing in the critical edge is by doing my own cartographic ge genealogical uh, story. And, uh, the critique of the human is, is, has got quite, uh, quite a history. And, and I would start, it, would start my account of how to bring the critical edge to bear on the
as human, by uh, pointing out to, with all due respect, to the humanities that the monopoly of the disciplines was already broken by my generation way back in the 60s and 70s with what I call the first generation of areas of studies that not knowing what to call themselves, call themselves studies. <laughs> and I'm collecting them, so please send. I have hundreds of those, but I made a selection for this. The prototype, of course, and it is the origin of mine, and if I can alter Professor Moore's institutional careers, where this does is gender, feminist, queer. It didn't exist until we brought it in, in the 70s, to make the university look like the 20th century, and the long march for the institutions. Race for colonial subaltern studies. I didn't exist until the people of color, people emerging from the colonial world says, where are we in your great humanities? You can really look at these critical studies and say, what is your human? Where am I in your human? In the, the work of uh, Stuart Hall, but the work of Sylvia Winter on the racialization of the human. Uh, what do you mean by human? It's intrinsically European, intrinsically white, intrinsically masculine, or can there be a human that actually reflects the diversity? That, that discourse has been brought in quite extensively. Cultural studies, do you remember cultural studies? The, the millennials cannot possibly remember, but in the 1980s, that was the forum. That is where Stuart Hall came in like a thunderbolt and made us understand the politics of discourse. And a transformative, vilified, underfunded, essential, um, particularly the British school, the Birmingham school uh, of this. And very little of it left, but it is a, a laboratory for so many of the critical discourses that carry on to the post-human era. My, my conversation with Paul Gilroy on this, and on, 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 on black perspective, and on the human and the post-human, the post-colonial redefinition of the human. Film and television studies. Do you remember the struggle to, to make film studies happen? The millennium must be rolling on the floor with laughter. But we did have to struggle to make film and television studies enter the university. Theatre had a monopoly. And I remember my colleague in Bologna saying, we can't do film studies. There is no muse for cinema. And they created an institute outside of Bologna for cinema. The dad, the favorite institute for Uberto Eco when everybody was teaching. But there is no muse. It. This is where we're coming from. And television and media studies, which to you look like <coughs> the cathedral of the 13th century, <laughs> where revolutionary ones are coming from. Second generation studies takes the, uh, the post anthropocentric turn a lot more seriously. This list is growing as we speak. Animal studies would be the prototype. But my personal favorite is critical plant studies. <laughs> I love it. And, it's in detail now. I am not making these up. I wish I was. These are all curricular publications, websites, all empirically grounded. The diversification and the degree of transdisciplinarity is both exciting and distressing. And uh, first study, success study, critical management studies. What could that possibly even mean? <laughs> Celebrity studies, study studies, etc., etc., etc. The point I'm trying to make is we have generations of studies that already explore the explosion and implosion of the human. And all of the undergrowth is there. It's between, beneath, and below the disciplines, but it is already in the picture. Uh, in the, and if I, if I think of, a, of an innovative structure like the Institute for Global Prosperity, media is written in. Uh, a place that would have no other institutional location. The media doesn't have the news, remember? It has no serious scientific credibility. So in the background of this, I think all of this is in a sense a research. You can, it is easy enough to read up on media theories, <coughs> gender theory, on race and post-colonial theory. They are sort of familiar others. They are other but familiar. Something else has been happening over the last. But new media, sorry, it's just new media is the, the example of the shift. Um, from media to new media, from new media to game, into the software, Christopher Green, Postman, and you see, can tell us what this week's novelty is, because the field moves. I suppose geology, media geology, would be next. The fastest moving has to be media. It's almost the, the, the meter. It gives, you, it gives you the criteria by which you can measure the speed of this implosion explosion. Now, what is happening now, I skip this part, is that over the last eight to ten years max, sometimes even 
um, more recently. We have the emergence of new discourses and new institutional structures that don't call themselves studies, they call themselves humanities. And you can look at, at, at Harvard. Harvard has had eco-criticism for about 20 years. But at one particular point, the environmental humanities come up. Stanford, if Stanford has always done the relationship between literature and life sciences. But at one particular point, the digital humanities come up. And, and of course, Duke has the largest digital humanities program with Catherine Hales as one of the leading features of this. But look at the environmental humanities immediately splitting into two, the blue and the green, blue for water research, green for earth research. And they're probably splitting again as we speak. But these sustainable or organic humanities are gigantic institutional structure with gigantic budgets. And, and my question then becomes, first of all, how did this change? This in terms of the learning philosophy, this is a re-territorialization. This is not another study there. This is another game coming up here, recomposing resources and discourses in manners that we have certainly not anticipated. Medical humanities at UCL, gigantic, for your biggest, um, uh, your, your, your hospital and medical faculty being a world leader. Evolutionary computer, 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 all of this, and I have to go quickly. And immediately the meta discourses. Post humanities, as I said before, in human humanities, digital humanities is 1999. Transformative, critical, nomadic, and I did not think of the nomadic humanities. Can somebody tell me what's wrong with me? It did not occur to me. Let's think something. Adjective of humanities, and I think that's um, what we have. So uh, there is here a shift of the scale of the uh, knowledge production um, that I want to interrogate critically and say what is the human and this post-humanities, how did this come about, how much of the humanities is covered by the post human how much of the humanities are involved in the environmental humanities. Let's look at the composition of this institute. Tiny, tiny amount. A bit of history and the inevitable ethics professor. Uh, but the rest is heavy duty engineering. And, and, and life faculties and earth sciences. In any case, a comparative study of this humanity is absolutely due, and I skip all the rest, otherwise I will be told off terribly. Um, but what I wanted to point out is that in my quest for the recomposition of knowledge production, I have not come across um, non-nationally indexed humanities. I have not come across um, feminist and queer humanities as programs as institutional realities, I've come across them as wishes and aspirations. Black humanities and migrant diasporic humanities, trade apart humanities, we all the love to Richard Rorty that, is, that made up that formulation, the poor white trade apart humanities, accusing the academics of neglecting the dispossessed whites. <laughs> Uh, 1998, the text by, by Rorty. I haven't seen decolonial humanities, child humanities, although recently, I don't know if the person is in the room, I received a message from somebody who's building up childhood humanities, and of course she didn't get her grant. Uh, but here we speak, the mayor wants to continue. And if that person is listening, do not give up. Of course we need a child's perspective and we need disabled humanities as well. The missing people, um, a little bit the usual suspects, plus a few more, they are not being integrated in this reorganization of knowledge. So my call is for planetary differential post-humanities that would involve serious crossovers between the indigenous, the decolonial, the racialized, the sexualized, and this magnificent new world of fourth industrial age converging with a sixth extinction that the humanities are clearly coming to terms with. This is not a crisis, it's a moment of incredible growth, but it is complex, and the power relations are pitched, in a sense, against um, the missing people, and my hope is that we can intervene to make the differential planetary post-humanity slightly more equitable, um, slightly more just uh, to become in and with the world in the respect for diversity. So a good social democratic message at the end. <laughs> Thank you for your
rules for the story. And so just let us consider for a moment then the idea that prosperity might be post human. Right? And what might we mean by that? So we have quite a few issues which we can think about in terms of the history of future global prosperity. So one is that we have a tension in the idea, because of course it has to be about, it has to be futuristic without being in any way evolutionary or progressive, progressive in the sense that there's a necessary progression to a particular kind of prosperity. So any kind of future prosperity has to be based on ethics of diversity, which is something we talk quite a lot about in the, in the IDP. It's of course a form of flourishing that isn't about the enhancements of the individual because it's about the flourishing of communities. And it's particularly about the flourishing of communities in the context of the planet, which means not only other people, but of course all of those things which you would come to call the non-human or the more than human. But nevertheless, underpinning that as an idea, the notion of prosperity has to be in some way about innovation in our knowledge, that is, the human knowledge. Because it can't be about simply innovation in geology. It can't be about innovation uh, <coughs> in uh, microbes. So the microbiome might be very important, but innovation in the microbiome will have a massive effect on humans, but it won't necessarily. We're not relying on the microbiome come up with the new social contract of the future. So it can't be, you can't be post-human in that sense. It has to be somehow rooted in a particular kind of human project and human flourishing. So um, what am I going to do with this contradiction, Rosie? And are, are we in prosperity? Are we, are we post-human? The only to answer me. Before we open to the floor. <laughs> well, I think <clears throat> given that we are looking at managing a transition yes. between an old order, an old economy, an old sense of the human, and the multiple emergent new ones, and there's a, a variety of them. And, and I think when you see how people are desperate for sources of inspiration, you see, for instance, one of the areas that's coming in is indigenous epistemology, which runs the risk of colonial appropriation. But the, but the, uh, the popularity of the work of Vivera de Castro or Philip Descola on, on non-Western systems of knowledge, they do not have a major capitalist interest. As an anthropologist, you would uh, be um, in a perfect position to do that. Sources of inspiration from areas you think, oh, um, uh, I would not have thought. The problem with the indigenous uh, interface with um, the post is that they raise the issue of spirituality and the post-secular, which is another huge issue. I put it on the side now. But we are managing a position a bit more desperate for sources of inspiration, and, and new conversations need to be brought together. But in this phase of transition, you can be post in several different, at uh, several different levels, thematically, methodologically, yeah. and ethically. Yeah. Thematically, we take on, as you said, a non-human. Well, you know, that's not so difficult. Algorithms. and the planet and planet beings. And uh, I think at the moment there's hardly any areas of research that does not have some non-human components. Uh, the things that are going to be more complicated when you're looking at the methodology. Yeah. If I need to think in terms of a continuum between myself, the algorithm, and the beings, the social contract constructivist idea that one is not born, one becomes a woman, is gone. It doesn't help. And I think it's the crisis of social constructivist methodologies that is at the core of the conversation here. This is why over the last 50 years I've been drifting more and more away from my Hegelian, Lacanian roots towards the Deleuzean Spinozist roots. Because Spinoza is the thinker in our own tradition that thinks the continuum between nature culture. Spinoza is the man that Hegel despised because he says we are all part of nature. And I was blessed to have a great Spinoza's teacher, Jenny Lloyd, look at uh, Jenny Lloyd's A Part of Nature book. A, a br brilliant introduction to Spinoza. And then go to Deleuze and you understand that that's exactly what Deleuze is doing. As he used his work, he used to start from the computer, ends up with us, literally, theologically, as well as technologically, to continue. And, but there is a lot of work that we need to do uh, about the methodology involved in this. And because I, again, my training and my generation, the voices in the back that says, you soft in the head. 
because there is no cutting off point between the natural and the cultural, between society, language and representation, the human and other species. So all kind of hierarchies of thoughts need to be unburned and replaced by other methodologies. And I'm always envious of the ease with which people who don't speak ordinary language, the mathematicians, the people in the sciences, can actually compose different modes of relation to their meta, because they have a different language. Mathematical algorithms, different protocols. So I've said that the core business, if you want to answer your question adequately, is fundamental labs and new methodologies. How would we actually implement a natural cultural continuum while still doing the work of criticism? And do we need really to invent new languages here, new practices? And if I look at some of the exciting uh, institutes, including the Disability Institute in Utrecht, I see that they are hiring writers in residence, artists in residence, and filmmakers to teach them to think differently. And, and I think the role of the arts in this, and again, think of the position that IGP and UCL is in with your tradition in this. Uh, the, the, the people who are creators and are allowed to take some risks. Some other people are going to the indigenous paradigm, that is cutting it off completely, say, I change tradition, so to speak. And through the racialization, ontologization of race, well, I can enter this discussion differently, not take the human, non-human distinction to begin with, and a different conversation. And uh, complicated, but I work with groups in Australia and in Vancouver, British Columbia on this. Uh, very strong presence of anthropologists. And then the institutional answers. And what do we do with the traditional humanities being underfunded and downgraded to teaching institutions? Let's face it, we teach more, four or five times more than people in the life science. And then these new mega institutes, and environmental humanities, digital humanities, getting the research funding. And I think this is another level of this discussion here for the senior professor. I think we need to call our governors to some sort of accountability and demand equal resources for what we need to do, which would be the methodological levels. But I think the, the, the point you made earlier in the talk was about the humanities being part of complexity. And I think that that's something that very much underpins the way we think about things in the IGP. Because here we're not talking about only doing the social sciences or only doing the humanities or only doing the science. We're talking about how can you create spaces for complex ecologies to emerge, which nevertheless have to be self-referential to a certain extent but they also have to engage with the process of constantly creating new languages, new kinds of practices, new kinds of institutions. So what worries me about some of these um, spaces that you've talked about as institutional forms in other universities is that although they look as though they're multidisciplinary, they're not actually about the creation of new languages and new spaces. They're about creating new boundaries. Mm -hmm. around themselves. So they become that form of knowledge innovation, which is, here we have a thing which is now called whatever it's called. Yeah? Uh, and I think that one of the things that you can't do with the notion of prosperity is to create a boundary around it, because of the fact that it is contextually specific, it is also forward moving. And that's really driven not by the really academic endeavor, it's really driven by people themselves, by a relation of attachment to the world, by a notion of sort of aspiration and, and hope. And I think you see that very well when you come to the point that, uh, another point you made, which is it doesn't help to see things in constant crisis. So for example, the most recent IPCC report that came out on climate change, restricting climate change to one point five degrees above historic levels. The problem with that pers perspective on, on the world is it's about fixing things, it's about fixing the crisis. The forward-looking effort that we have to engage in intellectually will never go anywhere if all we do is fix the current crisis, because we're not fixing the past. We have to, we have to evolve towards the future. Right? That's a much more difficult task. And so I mean, what do you see as the humanities role in that? You touched on it at the mm -hmm. end, but you didn't have time to elaborate on that point. Yes, good and complex, particularly for the ethical level and the construction of hope 
uh, is um, absolutely central to this exercise. And there's another way in which I could narrate this, this cartography by looking at the affective economies that we're in. And the manic depressive logic of a system, the excitement and the despair. And, and uh, we have that even, even, we would have that even without Brexit, and Brexit comes on top of that as well. Um, the, the notion of the excitement of this revolution and the incredible anxiety about its consequences, this up and down yeah. uh, mood control um, that, that is actually being registered across the new mental pathologies that we have, the incredible rates of burnout and uh, a lot of negative uh, statistics coming out, particularly from the youth, um, as you know. Burnout and suicide are a little bit out of control. Um, so a rather morose <laughs> mood, uh, melancholia, the sense of loss, um, uh, and a tendency to despair. Uh, and I think I haven't seen an epidemic of sadness on this scale um, in the 60 or so many years of my existence. I suppose as baby boomers, we always had the sense of um, that we were going somewhere. The sense of going nowhere is pretty strong at the moment. And uh, this is where really Spinoza really helps, because he lived in similar times. Um, he lived at the end of the Dutch Republic, um, where there was extraordinary experiments in early uh, modern European political history. He, he watched it coming crashing down with the assassinations and the despair of the times. And in the middle of that, he sat down and he wrote the ethics, which is a treaty on how to process pain and construct together affirmative, joyful passion. Yeah. It's a praxis. It's a practice. Um, the idea that joyful uh, affirmative ethics is a um, facile optimism misses the point. Capitalism sells you facile optimism. If I hear Gwyneth Pilfer tell us once again how she's so happy and perfect, I'm going to shoot her. And that's not <laughs> going. The superficial, I'll uh, be happy. That the cruel optimism, as Lauren Berlant puts it, it's not the joyful passion, the creation of hope, as we notice mode, is not that. It's about collecting endeavor to confront the conditions of our despair. It begins with the adequate understanding of what's gone wrong. And I would understand the third order of knowledge of Spinoza is what Marxists would call the critical ideology. But with the critical ideology, you go back to the social constructivist paradigm. With Spinoza, you're not. Adequate knowledge. But is the post cartography helpful as a navigational tool to give us a, a way to detect where things are going? Yes, no. If not, let's improve it. If yes, what are the implications? That very proactive way of actually acknowledging that we are in a pickle and that it's actually very complex and complexity is what we're dealing with, but then working together to resolve it, increasing our ability to take in and on the world. I think that construction of hope is a practice. I think it is a model for third millennial humanity. It's a strong built in ethical kick uh, where we either go with the version that says fascism is the sadness of the soul. It's, it's the sense of impotence, that, that there is no opening, and, and everything is shut down. And that's also the definition of sadness in Spinoza, that the horizon is closing in on you. Joy is the opening out of that. And there is a brilliant, I keep saying that, a brilliant British Spinozist, the, the British translator of Spinoza, an incredible woman, Mary Ann Evans, whom you know as George Eliot. Um, she's never taught, she's one of the great Spinoza. She translated the guy. Um, middle of March is one big introduction to Spinoza. Middle on the floss, the flood, the brother, the family. The, it's all relational ontology, geophysically grounded. And it's a crime not to have taught George Eliot as introduction to Spinoza, because you all know it. She just lived around the corner anyway. <laughs> and visit her place, enter the conversation through that, enter the discussion, and you'll see how immediately, intuitively, actually, understandable the stuff is. It is a change of paradigm, but we are going to have to learn to think differently, to deal with the complexity. So I would put that very, very strong, and I really, I think you've done great work on aspirations and hopes in your anthropological phase. I think it's very, very relevant to this. Um, somehow Spinoza is right when he says that there are two features of, human, of the human soul, um, an, an, an ontological attraction to joy, to, to well-being, to wanting to persevere in our existence, and persevering in being, being high on, on air, being drunk on water, as the verse puts it, a, a, an absolute ontological 
gravitational pull towards positivity, and the other feature is stupidity, not wanting to know the condition of a misery, and a tendency to avoidance, as psychoanalysis would put it. And the two together made the exercise of thinking into an ethical, clinical, and critical exercise, as the list puts it. So I think, I think it's right in our tradition. We don't even have to be particularly experimental. We can go back to the future here. Let's open it to the floor. So, yes. Yeah. Um, thank you, Rosie.